Okay, so Wednesday's midterm day, yeah? yeah? Yeah. And in case you have not gotten online recently, those uh, two previous midterms are posted in the assignments directory. So you can take a look at those. Um, does anyone have, want to ask me any questions about the midterm? Or questions about the previous one? Yeah? What's the format? The format is that it's a number of sheets of paper. Let's see. I think I've actually... So this is, which one was this? This was spring of last year. Uh, so these are the questions. A lot of write a statement, uh, write a complete C++ program, some uh, either multiple choice or true false, uh, write an if else statement, what is the output, write a for loop, true or false, write a function, this would have been the fall. What do we have here? <coughs> um, evaluate those expressions and say whether the expressions are true or false. What are the outputs? Fun. What will be output to the screen? Write a complete C++ program, if else. Yeah. You'll with your pencil. You'll be scribbling them down. So basically, what you're above all else, <clears throat> you will be prepared for this test if you can sit down and write programs. If I say, you know, write a program that's going to print your name ten times, and you can do that without looking at your notes, then you're in good shape. You know how to produce a for loop. Uh, you, that you know the structures of these loops and that you can write them out. Okay, so uh, there, there will be one, maybe two, that have you write a complete program, probably just one. And the idea is just to see that you have been writing enough code so that you know to put the pound include IO stream, that you're putting using namespace standard, or you're doing the STD colon colon everywhere on the C outs and the inlines that you can put the curly braces in the right places and the semicolons in the right places. Okay, So that, that's mostly what's, what you're being tested on, uh, is the structure of, of the different looping constructs and conditional constructs that we've been looking at. Do, while, while, for, those three types of loops, the if statement, the if else statement, uh, generally bits of trivia. I don't know if you'd call it trivia, but understanding the role of curly braces in code. Uh, right, the significance of curly braces uh, to block a set of statements for a for loop or for an if statement. Oh, uh, what else? Um, knowing about, and knowing about, we've talked about operator precedence, so you're not expected to memorize everything, although you certainly have some of them memorized. You have multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction memorized, at least where they are relatively on this chart. So the ability to understand this chart and uh, being able to evaluate expressions based on their precedence <coughs> of operators. You should even be able to understand the precedence of operators without understanding what they are. So, for instance, this is a really wacky one. It looks like an arrow and a splat, three characters together. Uh, if I put an A plus B, this weird operator here, C, you should be able to know the order. You may not know what it does, but you should know the order of operations, right? What's going to happen first, the addition or this weird thing? And addition's down below it, so this weird thing happens before the addition. Okay. So understanding operator precedence, understanding basic Boolean logic, meaning the kinds of things that you put in an if statement. Recall the assignment we had with the turn right, left, or straight, and red or green. So that was using the if statement and some Boolean expressions. 
if the direction is straight and the light is red, right? That's a Boolean expression. It evaluates to true or false ultimately. You understand the difference between true and false. There's certainly keywords in C++, true and false, which incidentally don't exist in C. Uh, but we know that zero is false and anything else on the planet is true. Right? Okay. That's the kind of stuff. But I would say, above all else, if you can write code without looking at your notes, then you're doing good. Uh, there, there isn't, there's, I would say the limit to uh, head scratch and figuring out how to do things would be on how to write expressions, so this kind of thing. I'm not tr really trying to trip you up, but I would like you to know how to figure out whether or not something's true. But yeah, mostly mostly simple syntax though. Any other questions? Okay. Any questions non midterm related, just about C in general? All right. <coughs> then I will just roll with it. <coughs> so one of the we have to follow the coding standards for project one. And one of the key aspects of those coding standards is that you use multiple files, or that you break your classes up into multiple files. And since we're dealing with this web counter class, we have to break it up. So let me start. Uh, as far as when you break it up, when you get really good at coding, or even just moderately good at coding, then you tend to be putting things in separate files right off the bat. However, when you're still struggling with the syntax of the language, you'll predominantly write a bunch of code in a single file and then break that up into separate files. I think that's a fine strategy. The challenge comes in knowing how to break things into separate files. Alright, so if I have a file that I need to break up into separate files, let's talk about the, the ways of doing that. Uh, one way, if I need to break, what did I call this file? Thank you. If I need to turn one big file into stuff, more stuff, and yet more stuff with those actual file names, uh, then one easy way of doing it is I can copy one big file into stuff, copy one big file into more stuff, and copy one big file into, what did I say, even more stuff, whatever I said. Now I've got, and then I've still got one big file which I don't need anymore, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. So here are my three separate files, but right now they have identical contents, yes? So all I have to do is go into stuff, and I just delete the things that I don't need in here. So I don't need anything below this point. The, the vim command that I would use to delete it would be to say dg, which is the delete command, and the g, uppercase g movement is to move to the end of the file. So I would go dg, write it out, I'm done with that one, come to more stuff. Uh, what I need here is I need the stuff in the middle here. So I can do, uh, again, I'll do D in a movement. So here I would do D1G. That takes me up to the beginning of the file, or DGG will take me to the beginning of the file, either one of those. D, DGG. And then this would be D uppercase G. That does more stuff. And then I come to here. And I basically need to delete everything from here to the beginning of the file. So D one G. And there we go. OK, so that's one strategy for breaking things up into separate files. The, uh, the strategy that I tend to use 
as someone who's proficient in Vim is I'll just simply find the line numbers. So I need stuff to go into lines one, one excuse me, lines one through five to go into stuff. So I'll say one comma five write stuff. Five lines written. Then I'll come here. Uh, seven through eleven are going to be written to more stuff. And thirteen through seventeen are going to be written to and yet more stuff. Question? Yes. Uh, you're not putting .cpt on there? Uh, yeah, I'm, so, since I'm just using pretend files, I'm not oh, paying okay. attention to suffixes. But presumably, you are dealing with C++ code, so your names will either be suffixed with either .cpp or .h. <coughs> Okay, so that's how you do that then. Let's talk about doing that specifically with C++ code. Just gonna write, I'm just going to bust out a bunch of code here real quick. Uh, what do we want for this? Uh, no, let me change this. Let me call this get day. And let me call this one set. And now I'm going to write these two functions. Day equals D, month equals M. All right. So I've got this simple date class. It has two variables, a day and a month. I've got a couple member functions here, one to retrieve whatever the day is, and one to, to basically set up my date with a day and a month. So the way I'd use that in main is I would say I want to create one of these, call it whatever you want, call it whatever you want. There you go. And we need to set the date of call it whatever you want. So let it so we have a function called set dot set and we need to provide it two numbers, a day and a month. So we will say the 4th of July. And now I am going to, let's see, I need some IO stream stuff. And I'll put this stuff. Let's use C out to see what it is. Uh, call it whatever you want day is equal to and I will then call oh boy, here's for copy and paste is helpful um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this on separate lines for readability since I've got the the kindergarten size font going here let's see we will call this get day Now, my motivation for typing all this in is just to have a discussion of using multiple files in C++, but before I go down that road, does anyone want to ask questions about what I have done?
I like the, your enthusiasm. Okay, anyone yawning, I'm going to choose them, and they're going to have to ask a question. All right. <coughs> okay, uh, so let's see if this darn thing works. G++, is it just me, or is it a little warm in here? A little warm. Okay. Ooh, that's weird. You see that in, like, horror movies, or... Mm. That's right, with the... Who was that hunk and back flash? Uh, there it is. Equal to the fourth day of the month. So this is kind of parallels what you might do for the project when you're writing the web counter class. So here's where you declare your web counter class. Again, the class declaration is like a blueprint. It is information for the compiler. You are not actually creating anything. You're not creating a house by having a blueprint of a house. This is the class definition. I guess I don't have to. Yes. Will your functions always be in public? <laughs> Will my functions always be in public? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is actually ends up being no. Your functions are, aren't always in public. So again, the distinction between public and private is, a, is letting you know what the access is to people to code outside of the class. So this is to just what I'm talking about, I would call this code inside of the class. This is a function which belongs to the date class. That's what this designation is doing here. Okay, so the idea of public and private has no meaning whatsoever for the code in this function. Note that even though day is private, I'm able to access it directly. Okay, so these specifiers, public and private, just have to do with things outside of the class, users of the class, if you will. And the uh, classic user in code we've seen so far is main. Main is something, here is main using the date class. It is creating an object of type date. Just as here I am creating an integer, excuse me, here I'm uh, creating an, I wouldn't use this terminology, but it's synonymous to say uh, here I'm creating an object of type integer, or here I'm creating an object of type float. Here I'm creating an object of type date. Okay, that's a parallel I'm trying to draw here. I'm actually creating something. And what am I creating? I've specified it here in the blueprint. And the blueprint, here's the, the stuff that it's actually creating, a day and a month. So call it whatever you want, has a day and a month. All right. Uh, I have made the set function public, and I have made the get day function public. That means that outsiders, such as this code here, code that uses date, is allowed to use it because it's public. And we see that. And where is that enforced? That's enforced by the compiler. So it compiles just fine. If I come up here, I don't change anything else in my program, and I take get day here, and I put it in private. Now, when I try to compile, <coughs> It complains. And note, it's complaining about uh, this line of code, which appears in main. And it's saying, no, 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 I'm sorry, main. You have absolutely no business at all calling this function because it is private. Uh, and it's saying, here's where it's declared private on line 9. And if I look, sure enough, here's line 9 in, this, in the private area. Uh, so the question is, well, why in the world would you ever make any sort of function private? Because it suddenly becomes completely useless to any code that wants to use date. And the answer to the question is to the, a reason why I may want to put some sort of function in here is because uh, it is what I would refer to as an internal function. Now, I wouldn't actually call it internal function, but the idea here is here's, here's some complex algorithm. Who knows what it does? It, it's figuring out you know, how many days have occurred since from 1960 to this day month and 
some year. Uh, and it's some complex algorithm you have to run to figure that out. And I've got 20 public member functions in here, and about five to eight of those need to use that algorithm. Well, I can either rewrite that complex algorithm five to eight times for each of those functions, or I can write that complex algorithm once, put it in this function, and then each of these other functions that use it just simply have to call it. Because recall, code inside of that is part of the date class is able to use anything that's private just fine. So those are the, the circumstances under which you would make a function private. Any other questions? Yes? Can you refresh my memory again? Um, in the, the date set, we uh, don't have to declare the variable day or month. We just set it right. And this is, this is by far the hardest hurdle for everyone to get over. Setting aside the, the weirdness of the syntax and getting used to that and all the bits you need, the single hardest thing to wrap your head around is this stuff right here. And the best thing I can do is tell you, go back to that screencast and watch Luke and Lottie standing up here. Because when I tell them set and I gave them 3,000, they didn't even blink and you didn't even blink because you went, when I asked Lottie to set to 3,000, she knew exactly where to turn to the whiteboard and erase that little patch of real estate and write 3,000 there, right? Lottie had a number of hits variable. And so her set function is able to use that variable without any question. Likewise, Luke had a number of hits variable. And when I say Luke set, Luke's able to set his. So when I bring a third person up and I say, you're a date and you're July 4th, and I say, get day, or I say uh, set, and I give you 4th of July, without even blinking, that person's going to turn around and erase their two variables up here and put 7 for July and 4 for the day. Or excuse me, 7 for the month and 4 for the day. All right? So any code, and here's the key, any code that is part of the date class has access to all of the data of that class. In, just intrinsically, that, that's the, the whole point of the exercise. So a class, no matter if it's public or private, will always have access to itself. Regardless of, right. So I wouldn't say a class, whether public or private. I would say the data within a class, whether that data is public or private, uh, all, you always have access to that data. Yes, you know, you're never kept from accessing your own data. Public and private only has meaning to people outside of the class who want to interact with it. The only place, so the only place where you see int day semicolon is in this blueprint, right? So think of this as a blueprint of a house, and this is the front door. When does the front door get built? It gets built when you unroll that blueprint and you get your, your hammer and your saw and your nails and you start building the house, right? And it's when you build that house that you build the door. It's when you build the date, a date, Again, when you have a blueprint, you can make as many houses as you want. So I can make as many dates as I want. Whenever I create a date, that date that I create will have a day and will have a month. And where do I create it? Here's an example of where I'm creating it. Or excuse me, I'm wrong. Here's where you create it. If I want to create another one, okay, now, now this one has a day and a month, and this one has a day and a month. And I can, I can just keep going all day. That one has a day and a month, right? That's why this code works and why I'm not doing any special things to access day and month. Because the assumption is when I call the function right here, how does it know whose day and month is being manipulated here? Well, clearly it is call it whatever you want, day and month. And here it's clearly X's day and month that's getting set. Okay. Other questions? All right. So we want to. We have a need to divide all of this up. I'm gonna get rid of this extra code. Make sure I've got. Okay, this is all fine. I better compile again. Make sure I'm good. I'm good. 
the blue the class declaration, which is like a blueprint, these always go in header files. So what is it that we've been doing with header files all semester? Excuse me, all semester. We've been including them. We've been putting copies of header files typically at the top of files we're working with. All right, uh, and this blueprint that goes from lines five through twelve, I may use in five applications across thousands and thousands of files. It's a blueprint. I can use it wherever I want. Another example of a blueprint is how do you do output to the screen? Well, you do it with C out. So we include IO streams so that we're able to use C out. And uh, we've used this in many, many different programs. So doesn't it stand to reason that if I put this in a header file, I could use it in many, many different programs, just as you're using C out in many, many different programs. All right. So I'm going to say from lines 5 through 12, I want to write out and the convention generally is the name of the class in a dot h suffix. <clears throat> and then I will uh, delete lines 5 through 12. Oops, I guess I should have done 4 through 12 to get that comment. All right. So the, the blueprint part of it, the class declaration, generally is what goes into the header file. All of this would go into dates source file, or dates CPP file, yes? Uh, does the exclamation point you just use um, rewrite the file? The yes. So uh, you know when you, if I get into Microsoft Word and I type in some stuff and, and then I go to close that document, it says, you haven't saved. Are you sure you want to quit? Okay, so the equivalent of that is, um, or no, I, that's a bad example. So I, I type in some stuff in Word, and then I save it as letter.text, but letter.text already exists. It's, uh, it, probably, it gives you a message saying, hey, let, yeah, are you sure you want to override it? Yeah, so that's the exact analogy. Whenever I, if I try to write this as date.h, it tells me that the file exists, and it will not override it. And the way is to override its unwillingness is with that exclamation point. So if I say W exclamation point, then it will blow away the current contents and redo it. Absolutely. Because we have that date information in the dot H, now this line will no longer compile. We can try it. Uh, date.cpp. So I say g++ date.cpp and I get use of undeclared identifier date, meaning you have not told me what date is. I'm sorry. I have no idea what you're talking about here. And the same thing here. And the same thing here. All right. So that follows the general rule. Before you can use it, you have to tell the compiler what it is. So Let's tell the compiler what a date is by including a copy of the blueprint before we use it. <coughs> now that should work fine. Let's try that again. Okay. So far, so good. So the, the class definition, meaning the source code that you write for each of the member functions of the class are what go in date.cpp. And that, that happens to be what I'd called this file. So I'm good at just leaving it like this. However, main then, in the context of our project, this is the test program. So to, make, to say it generically, line 17 through 25 is just a bunch of code that uses my date. And it shouldn't be bundled in with date because I want to keep all that code separate so that I can use it in, in hundreds of projects. So I want to write this stuff out. I will go ahead and from line 17 through 25, I'm going to write it out. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what to call it. We'll call it dateproject.cpp. Or maybe I'll call it uh, my test program.cpp. How about that? 
Now I can delete all this stuff because that's in testprogram.cpp. And looking at what I have, I have the definitions for each of the member functions and date. I have the class declaration or the blueprint, if you will, the last time I compiled. And then I have main. So I have issues with main. If I try compiling this, It doesn't know what a date is again. Exact same problem. You have to tell it what it is before you're allowed to use it. Here I'm trying to use it. It also doesn't know about C out. So I have to include IO stream for C out. We'll go ahead and do this to save us some typing down the road. And then we will include a copy of date.h. And very quickly, what's the difference between the angle braces and the double quotes? They're exactly the same except. Right. The, the double quotes will check your current directory before it looks in its kind of predefined areas for header files. And is that space between that? Uh, that that's a matter of uh, visual preference, so whatever, whatever makes you happy. It's not, not required. Now, <clears throat> let's see. If I compile date.cpp, Huh, what's going on here? Why am I unable to create an application? Anyone? Because it doesn't have a main. Because it doesn't have a main. There is no main in date.cpp. What exactly is complaining about there being no main? Is the compiler complaining? No. All right. So this was covered in detail on Friday. What are the four steps? Linker, preprocessor, compiler, assembler, linker. Preprocessor deals with those pound includes. The compiler deals that turns the C++ code into assembly language. The assembler is uh, um, specific to the vendor that created the CPU, the chip, Intel, Motorola, so on and so forth. And then the linker, since these three will run over and over again, <laughs> for each CPP file, then the linker's job is to take all function calls and connect them with wherever the, that function was defined. Okay. Uh, oh, darn it. All right. So I can say, uh, what is the? Does anyone remember again? Since these happen on each of the CPP files by themselves, does anyone remember the option to make sure these three things happen, but it doesn't bother trying to link? It starts with a dash. There's your hint. Dash O is to name the executable. Uh, dash S is what produces the assembly. Dash C. Dash C means do these three, but stop after you get object code. We're going to link some other time. And it produces, this produces a machine readable .o file. But again, the linker hasn't been run, so this is, although this is machine readable, it's not code that you can execute because it's incomplete. Okay? So I can do that. I can say G minus C, date.cpp. Now I do uh, an ls, and there we see it, date.o. I can do the same thing, G minus C, my test program minus C, do my ls, and there's testprog.o. Now, uh, what would be nice, and I wish I was able to show it off like this, what would be perfect is if I did this. Uh, but it turns out that there are a whole bunch of options and additional bootstrap files that get attached here that you don't see that G++ handles under the hood. So what I have to do for that last step of linking them together, just say G++. And what G++ does is it skips the first three steps 
since those have been done, and it simply calls the linker with all the correct arguments and extra files and bundles that into an executable. So I do that, uh, even though there was one there. There it is again. That one should be brand new. Should be able to run it. And there we go. It all comes together. All right. Did you make a make file with the .dot files? Can you make? Would you make a make file with the .dot files? Yes. And now this is the true. This is where we get into the true utility of make files. So, what is the name of my program? I called it. Uh, I have it as a .dot out. Uh, Let's not do that. It, let me go back a step. So if I was to compile this and I wanted to give this a name other than a.out, how would I do that? Dash o, and I would call it my, uh, my date yeah, thank you, date, date project. Wait, I'll, make, I'll make it all uppercase like that. Date project, right? Now I do my ls, and there it is. Okay, so the dash o option. So here's my make file. What I want to create is I want to create date project. What files do I have to have in order to make date project? Date.o. Date.o and I'll give you a hint at ensign.o. Testprog.o. Okay. What is the command that I typed at the command line to create that? G plus plus date.o testprog dot o dash o date project right that's what I typed to get that all right now that's incomplete because before this thing works I have to create a date dot o and I have to create a test prog dot o so if I want to create a date dot o what files are required to create a date dot o date dot cpp and there's one other key file that's required date dot h even though we, this isn't on the compile line, it's on the include line. So my list of files uh, that this depends on has to include the CPP file plus any header files. In theory, you could put IOStream here, but, but you don't really have control over IOStream, so don't bother. Uh, G++, what's the option to get a .o? Dash C, date.cpp. We have one more, which is we have to create testprog.o. That uh, depends on testprog.cpp and date.h, because we pound include date.h. What's the command? G++ minus C, testprog.cpp. Now this is a complete working make file. Let's test it out. What I want to do is I want to remove all of my object files. Oh, let me give you another one. Uh, here's a nice thing that uh, people put in sometimes. Clean. Clean. Uh, what we do is, I think I can just leave that blank here. Leave this blank. I won't write that. And to clean, we want to remove all of my object files and my date project executable. So I just have a little wild card there, yeah? So now what I can do is I can say make clean. And I kind of clean up things so, I, so that all I'm left with is my original source. And we're not going to deal with a dot out anymore. Let's look at that again. OK, here we go. I can either say make, if I say, I can, excuse me, I can say make date project. In which case, it's going to go to the make file. It's going to try and do the rule starting with date project, which is this one. It'll find that these haven't been built yet, so it's going to come down and do each of these rules as well. Okay. If I just type make without any arguments, then which of these rules gets run? Uh, specifically, the first one. And it just so happens that the first one triggers the rest of them, except for clean. You have to, if it, so you're allowed to type make without any other information, it'll run the first rule. If, if you want to run a rule that's not the first rule, then you actually have to name that rule. So you have to actually type make clean. So I type make. There it is. If I try typing make again, it's intelligent. There's nothing for me to do. If I removed my executable, 
Then I type make. It knows it has to redo that last step. If I go into, let me type make again, doesn't need to do anything. If I go into date.cpp and I changed something in here, then it's intelligent enough to know that it only needs to recompile date.cpp and then run the linker again to recreate the executable. So the make file is now giving us intelligent compiling. Not a big deal with a project consisting of two files and a header file. A big deal when you've got 500 or 1,000 files because if you change one of those 1,000 files, you don't want to recompile a 1,000 times. You want to recompile once for only that one file you changed and then have this linker link together 1,000.0 files. Okay. All right, questions on that? Uh, when did I say that this project was due? Sunday. When? Sunday. Uh, after Friday. Okay, perfect. Good. So I've almost got, I think, uh, almost everything covered in those coding standards except for date.h where um, it talks about this stuff. And uh, I don't have time to talk about this right now, obviously. So this, since we have the exam on Wednesday, this will be the final piece of the puzzle that I cover on Friday. OK. Um, that leaves us with what? Secret word? Mean? A person's look or manner indicating their character or mood? Looking at <clears throat> that child's mean clearly indicates that their balloon had popped. Yes? Where do I come up with these words? Uh, most of I actually I have a file called coolwords.txt that I keep in a subdirectory and when I'm reading uh, articles and stuff and I see a word that I don't recognize then I look it up and make a note of it try and commit it to memory all that's great except for the last part because I never commit it to memory so of all these words I've shown you I'd say maybe uh, three or four of them is all that I've committed to memory <laughs> But someday. All right. Well, uh, good luck on the midterm. We'll see you on Wednesday.